G'day, my name is Brendan. Thanks for having me. My talk is on Fast by Friday. What would it take to solve any computer performance issue in five days? Think about what engineering work it would take. Because if we can, imagine solving the performance of anything operating systems, kernels, web browsers, phones, applications in five days. For example, Linux, Windows, Chrome, websites, Amazon.com, your company's website. I think websites should load in the blink of an eye. And what do we need to build to make that possible? Having timely performance analysis allows faster and more efficient options to be adopted. And here's an essence of the talk is that there's so much complexity. There's so many new features, so many new products to choose that we don't have time to test them all. If we get faster at testing things, we can pick the right things and the whole industry moves forward. It's good for the environment. Less cycles, energy and carbon. It's good for innovation as performance is part of everything. It's part of so many products and features and rewarding it Having customers adopt that performance investments will mean more investment in engineering and performance rather than marketing. It's good for companies and it's good for end users. My vision is fast by Friday to describe it in a nutshell. Any computer performance issue reported on Monday should be solved by Friday or sooner. I've done performance engineering for roughly 20 years now, and things are getting slower and more complex. But if I think of the multi-week and multi-month performance analysis that we do, and when you finally have that win, you realize there was only really one week or less of work to find that performance issue. And you had all of this weeks before it of prepping the customer environment, getting things turned on, getting the tools installed, exonerating parts before you got focused on that one target. If we can fix all of that prep work time to be immediate, then we can really solve everything in one week. So when I say any computer performance issue, I mean any performance analysis task, especially software hardware evaluations. And solved by Friday doesn't mean fixed, it means getting to the point where the root cause or causes are known. So this is a vision. It's also a way of thinking. Previously, you may spend three months working on a performance issue and think, yes, I solved it. In this way of thinking, that's two and three quarter months too long. It should have taken a week. And have a retrospective on what should you fix to make it a week. It's a call to action because we have to fix a bunch of things in the operating system, in the kernel, in new tools. There's a methodology I'll introduce, and it's a practical deadline. I've said before, I want to completely understand the performance of everything, but that's not enough. If only Brendan can understand everything in given six months, it has to be done quickly and by all of us. And it's the first of three activities. So I'm talking about finding the root cause of performance problems in five days. I'm not talking about developing the fix or deploying the fix. And I think it's the finding, putting your finger on where that problem is, is the biggest obstacle. That might sound a bit strange to talk to a room full of Linux people because you fix something and it can take years and years before that's deployed in the customer environment. But if you had a big enough win, customers can deploy it very fast. And this is a, a story. Years ago I was at Netflix when the the certain paper, the scheduling paper about wasted cores came out that everyone read, and that talked about possible huge wins if you deploy a patch set. Huge problems with the Linux scheduler wasting cores for a decade. I dropped what I was doing because the potential for Netflix was so huge, I had to immediately start work on it. Because every day we would have been losing so much money if we didn't deploy those patches. And as it turns out, it was not widely applicable and there was no huge performance win for us. If it was, we would have had that kernel running by Friday. So 
given a reason to, people can deploy quickly. Security is another one. But the biggest obstacle is just knowing that there's an issue in the first place, and that's what Fast by Friday is about. To talk about the problem, this is a Moore's Law-like chart of expected performance improve, improvement for computing products. Everything is getting faster. CPUs are getting faster, memory is getting faster, libraries, compilers. This is what should happen for my company's application or my microservice or my subsystem. Every year it should be getting better. In reality, it often looks like this. It's very sad. And we run out of time to find bottlenecks. There's not enough time to properly analyze all of the new software, hardware, and compiler options. This looks very similar to things I've worked over the years, this graph of where a very large microservice spending millions of dollars a year or a very large customer environment just isn't moving and because the development team just doesn't have the time. In fact, I've mentioned one ICX Intel compiler. I've heard of someone who has recompiled their world using the Intel compiler and found a big performance improvement. How many, here, how many people here have used the Intel compiler in the last 12 months? You work at Intel, Colin, so you don't count. So that's it. No one. Stephen, is that might have? A question. I, I kind of noticed that you started after Spectre. I said start after, started after Spectre. After Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> My point here is that, cool. There is this option, but none of us have time to do it. Who has time to recompile everything just in case it's, it's faster? And, and but there's so many, that's just one example out, out of many. And this is the growing problem, where aggression is not solved in time. And so you've got an amount of lost performance because of, it's the analysis time. It's not that the products don't exist. It's because we can't eval them in five days. Computers are getting increasingly complex. I've drawn this diagram about hardware, but software is much worse. And, of course, performance issues can now go unsolved for weeks and months and years. And we miss improvements because just finding out it, it matters and quantifying that it helps takes too long. I had one last week where an, a colleague at Intel was telling me, oh, the customer's not using QAT. I can't believe it. They're not using QAT. And they're on the cloud, and the cloud isn't doing the, it's not doing the virtualization for the QAT, so it's getting blocked. It's like, oh, there's probably some WRMSR instructions that the hypervisor is not handling. But it's like, who has time? Like, that's your perspective within Intel. If, for a customer, I bet if you talk to most customers, they don't even know about that accelerator and IAX and DSA and, and various other things because there's just so many options. As an analogy, imagine you build the world's fastest car and the customer says it's not. And you investigate and find they were sent the wrong car with flat tires, unbalanced wheels, an engine issue, all the firmware, and it goes on and on and on. And the time it takes you to debug that, the customer gets tired and leaves. This is what we see in computing all the time. I used to work at some microsystems, now I work at Intel. And I've been involved in a lot of high performance products, but the problem was you knew that there was some configuration issue that we've missed, and you've only got one week left to finish the eval. Otherwise, the customer will kick you out. And you're just scrambling, trying to, let's check the configuration, let's check this, let's profile it, find that dumb thing. So you have to make it fast by Friday. How do I think we can do this? Here's a proposed agenda. And I'll go through these steps. Prior weeks, everything has to work on Monday. That's like half of it. There are some critical analysis tools I'd call crisis tools. They have to be pre-installed. So ProcPS and Sysstat, Linux tools common, beat the BCC tools, and so on. Too many times I've been, we've got a performance issue, it's on fire, and the tools aren't there. And I can't type apt-get, update apt-get install when the system is melting down. It would take too long. It has to be there from the get-go. Stack tracing and symbols should work. We spend so much time just fixing that for all the different software components. Tracing should work. The performance engineers 
should have host SSH root access. This is just another battle we're fighting because companies are turning it off. And then they've got a performance meltdown and no one can log in. You should have a functional diagram of the system so you know where the data flow is and what, what the target actually is. And you should have source code access if possible. In my last book, I did a list of crisis tools. I should stick this on my blog. If you're a Linux enterprise distro, you should have the crisis tools by default. So, the, so the, we just don't lose that time. So it's ready to go on Monday. In fact, because I often find that they're not there, but Ftrace is there, I end up using Ftrace a lot for things. And I've got various of my tools are Ftrace-based tools. I give a lot of eBPF talks, and I think, oh, I'll do some eBPF case studies. That was a great thing I found. And then I have a look and went, oh, no, I actually used Ftrace for that because the, the B, BPF stuff wasn't installed, and I needed to solve it straight away. So I just used Ftrace. So by Monday, you can, you can start analysis and get going. On Monday, quantif quantify the problem. I put it in the slides, which will be online. There was this old methodology we would use some microsystems, the problem statement method. I didn't come up with it. This came up from field engineering. Where they'd go through a series of questions you could do over the phone and actually solve a lot of problems. Like, what makes you think there is a performance problem? Oh, this counter went high. It's like, yes, is there a performance problem? No, I was just having a look at proc counters and noticed it. Has the system ever performed well? Because I'd be asked from time, from time to time, there's a performance issue, jump on it. And you're looking at it, and you're looking at the summary since boot counters. It's like, I don't get it. The system's been on fire for like the last three months. Yeah, it's, ever since we turned it on, it's been performing badly. It took three months before we asked you to fix it. So you go through a series, a series of these questions, and it helps you see if anything dumb is in the way and to quantify it. Express the issue in terms of latency or runtime. The next thing is static performance tuning. And that is, this comes, comes from a Sun Blueprint in 2000 by Richard Elling. It's about analysis of a system without load. With load, it's dynamic performance. But without load, it's static performance. And so you can do this on an idle system. And it's just checking all the hardware, software versions, past errors, configuration, what library versions are you using, and so on. Did you compile everything with ICX? Then load versus implementation. Is it just a problem with load? We're actually pretty good at this one because everyone's got graphs and, and we'll look at changes over time, usually solved. So I think for this, for, for day one Monday, you can get to the end of here. Industry is actually pretty good at this. If you get to the end of the day and you haven't solved the problem, we now know it's a real issue of this magnitude affecting these systems and it's not just config or load. Tuesday, recent issue checklist. These have been used by companies before. They work, they're effective. I think in the future, recent issue checklists is, is really good fodder for AI. And Intel has one called Granulate, but there's also another one. There's, a, there's at least one other. Uh, in fact, Red Hat was working on, or Oracle was working on one. So there's the idea of doing this auto-tuning and teaching it based on recent issues. Great. I'm for that because we have too much stuff to do in five days. So if AI can do it for me and make that immediate, that's, that's awesome. If it's not from the recent issue checklist, now it's elimination, subsystems that it isn't. And I think it's impossible to deep dive on everything in five days. So we need tools to exonerate components and say it is not MM and it is not TCP and it's not VFS or whatever. Once we have those tools, we can then put them into dashboards. They could go into Prometheus, Grafana, whatever people use. And you would see green traffic lights for everything except for these subsystems. And then for the rest of the week, you focus on those subsystems. These could also include experiments running micro benchmarks. I think we're bad at this because we don't have a lot of tools. These new observability tools often need kernel superpowers. So ideally, they can be developed and run in situ on that, in that production environment by Friday. eBPF is great for this because it's programmatic. 
I've been in, in meetings with development teams where they say, we've got this issue, it's the storage I.O. issue, and we're looking at these flags. And I've developed the tool before the meeting has end, ended and run it in production and given them the answer because I can just beat the F tracer. So it's another important part of why I think like the time is now we can really take on doing this in five days because we have this superpower we can use. And we've got an example on the slides. Another one is, show me how much of workload A was queued behind workload B. So it's not just a matter of kernel counters or histograms of latency, which I know things like Ftrace can do very well, but it, it's, it's more of a state machine where the latency is either on an idle system or you're blocked behind that, behind that specific workload and I need to only know the latency when I'm blocked behind that workload. And so now it's all these filters and I know I'll walk out of here and Stephen Ristel will tell me, but Ftrace can do this. <laughs> I just haven't used it yet. But that's, what, that's the kind of thing I would use eBPF for. It's, it's much more programmatic. And Ftrace, Perf, Perf with eBPF also have kernel superpowers. I haven't used the tracing ponies for a long time. The current eBPF tools, a lot that I've, been publish, that I've published, are things like something snoop and something top and stat, count, slower, disk. They're good for later methodologies, later anal analysis methodologies. So my call to action is about developing new tools, which would be health tools or diagnosis tools to support Fast by Friday. They analyze the current dynamic workload. They should be open source. And I'm not going to encourage that, that they go into BCC. These can go into Linux because the maintainers don't have enough work as it is. We'll send them all into Linux where they can go like unit tests so that they can be also be maintained in lockstep with the, the subsystem that they're monitoring. Not just Linux, other open source projects as well. They all have test suites these days. But the idea is you also put these health or diagnostic tools in with the test suite so that other people can immediately see, is the subsystem a problem? Is it maybe a problem or not a problem? I've also got a recommendation here that I think the person who writes the tool, the health tool, should be the author of the original code. So I help look after the eBPF repositories of tools. And you have a lot of newcomers who are new to eBPF, they're new to some subsystem, and they're trying to write tools for it. And it's great to have people wanting to help, but Linux subsystems get really, really complicated, and there's all sorts of caveats and gotchas, and ideally you have the author of that subsystem write the tool, or at least share how the tool can be written, and then someone else can actually do the tool. I thought, you know what, I should do it as a thought exercise because I wrote the subsystem, I wrote the CFSL to ARC. Like, how would I write a health check tool for it? Well, it's easy because I designed it so it's never a performance issue. The CFSL to ARC is a level of cache in between main memory and disk. So it's designed to use uh, SSDs, and I wrote it in 2007, 2008. So it was, uh, it was fun and pioneering, but I designed it so that it shouldn't slow down the system because it's a cache. But when I started thinking about the health tool, the health tool shouldn't be echo good because I'm never a problem. That's it. There's, no, there's actually no health tool. There are situations when my L2 arc can hurt performance. So as a cache from main memory, it has to scan memory lists to look for eligible pages to cache. That consumes CPU cycles. It has to send those pages down to disk. That consumes disk bandwidth. It uses kernel metadata to, to refer to all of these things. So the more you think about it, you think, oh, this, this, actually there are possibilities. It would be very rare. More likely if you tuned the L2 arc in weird ways, you'd actually cause a performance issue. So yeah, it's actually a bit tricky. So in summary, like I could write a very long, and should write a very long document on how to actually do that health tool. A l 2 arc health tool could use the kernel counters to check for possible resource contention versus hand-picked thresholds and report good or maybe issue. And if there is a maybe issue to do an invasive test that disables the l 2 arc because it's just a cache layer, to see if performance improves. And I think practically that's what I'd do. Is my microphone rubbing? Just move around.
a little bit quacking. I think I might have fixed it. No, that's still quite awkward. What I hear is not what you hear, you hear, so I can't debug this. <laughs> I need to walk at the back of the room. Like Flag Friday, de debug it. So that's how I practically do it. I, I actually base this a lot on using kernel counters. Actually, I can really hear this. I'll take it off. Okay, can we still hear me? All right, excellent. So I come up with a practical way of doing this health check tool. Would it be perfect? No. I could make it smarter by using k probes and k funks around eBPF. And I think that once you've, I've created the tool, it should live in the ZFS code base where it's maintained. And so I'd say a ugly half good tool is better than no tool. Sharing thoughts can let other people write it. I know a lot of kernel developers are, are flat out busy. So, uh, and in fact, I had the example on the earlier slide. For DC TCP, that was written by Daniel Borkman. So Daniel should write the DC TCP health. Jens earlier was talking about CD-ROM. So Jens can write the CD-ROM health tool. But if I went around and asked these kernel developers to please write me the health tool, I know it would be on their list of many things. It's hard to do. But as, as a more practical ask, could they at least write a document, maybe in the Linux kernel, that says health? How would you understand the health of my subsystem, my project? And then just write it out. And then someone else can implement the tool. So if you look around the room, I know a bunch of you have written subsystems in Linux. If you've written a subsystem, at least write the health document. And then if you have not written a Linux subsystem, you can turn the health document into a tool. And then at the end of this, we have a dashboard. And then the dashboard will give us traffic lights. And then we'll immediately get focused on the problem rather than looking around other places. Super important to clear that operating table for what the most likely issue is. For these health tools, being pragmatic, reporting maybe is OK. When I was thinking about the L2 arc, it's like, oh, it's so hard to be precise. It doesn't have to be precise. It just has to say, yes, it's probably a problem, but you'll have to investigate yourself. I wanted to make the point that diagnostics is a thing that the industry has done for decades. Like, you get these days, if you're into C64, retro computing, you get the diagnostics cartridge that will test that the hardware is all good. It's sending its own workload and checking counters and things. That's not what health tools do. Health tools need to primarily look at the current workload and see if things are healthy. And you can, or, you can organize the tests from a safe to violent and only progressive needed. So you start with a very safe look at performance. And if everything's fine, don't even do the more invasive tests and be pragmatic. A lot of the current tools, in fact, pretty much all of the current tools are, here's data, you figure it out. And I'm suggesting we write tools that say, I figure it out. And so here's the answer. So at the end of Tuesday, if you still have an issue, we now know it's not a recent issue because we went through that. Maybe AI did it for us. And we eliminated all of these components so that it's, we've got like three maybe components or one definitely component. Wednesday profiling. CP Flame Graph solves so many issues because it shows you the developer's code shows you the code paths and where you're in. And we got flame graphs into Linux perf just as Analdo walks in. So you can just run perf script flame graph, I think. I'm still using my versions of it. But that's, that's great to see. And I'll talk about runtime stack walkers in a bit. CPI flame graphs for a different view of performance. That's where I'm decorating the flame graph with cycles per instruction. So you don't just know, yes, I was on these frames were on CPU or these functions are on CPU, you know, is it more stall cycle heavy or is it instruction retired heavy? Because there's a different actionable item for the developer. And then off CPU flame graphs, which, we, which have been impractical without eBPF, that's where I'm looking at the blocking time whenever you block, and then I get the stack trace so that all of those issues can be diagnosed. And it gets complicated because the stack trace from blocking time 
is often you're blocked on a conditional variable. You're, you're blocked on epoll or something like that. It's not actually so, I know that. <laughs> like, I need to know why I was blocked on epoll for so long or the CV. And so with off CPU flame graphs, I then walk the waker stacks, like the chain of waker stacks. So if another thread sent me the wake up, what was that doing? Why, was it, why did it take so long before it sent me the wake up? Once that's automated, you can run your CPU, CPU and off-CPU flame graphs on Wednesday. You've actually solved most performance issues. It just needs a whole heap of preparation for these flame graphs to be click button and work. If it's not solved by the end of Wednesday, you know it's caused by these code paths. Thursday. On Thursday, we can look at latency, logs, critical path analysis, hardware. So latency drill downs histograms, heat maps, and outliers, and try to go right down to where the latency is coming from. Logs and event tracing, lots of information there. Critical path analysis is great for multi-threaded or distributed systems. They can say it's this span that was blocking everybody else when things are running in parallel. And also getting into hardware counters. Intel likes to get into hardware counters quite a lot, but there's usually bigger fish to fry when you're just looking at the code paths and the static performance tuning. So that's why I've kind of put it later on the list. eBPF is currently used for a lot of this. So my distribution tools and slower tools for looking at histograms, heat maps, and latency outliers. Custom event logs using more eBPF tools. Distributed tracing. eBPF should revolutionize it because we can attach to U probes and look at API calls without having to do the open telemetry static code changes to do instrumentation. However, U-probes are currently slow because they in three into the kernel. And we know we're supposed to do the, the, this U-probe speed up work so you can LD preload and, and jump into that and do some instrumentation. Uh, each time we have Linux plumbers and we talk about it, we say, how about you do it? No, how about you do it? No, how about you do it? And then it just doesn't get done. We still haven't got it done. Once it finally gets done, it'll be awesome because then I think that that will be totally different. You can do distributed tracing without changing your code. And then hardware counters, perf, and supplements. At the end of Thursday, if it's still unsolved, you know all the details about the latency, you know which component it's coming from, and that it's not a low-level hardware issue. And then finally, on Friday, efficiency in algorithms. And this is the hardest. And I've got industry status one out of five. Is the target efficient? And I think this is a largely unsolved problem. And I've seen so many large environments and sites and microservices where, oh, it's taking 80 milliseconds for this request. And you think, 80, 80 milliseconds of CPU time? The request is not that complicated. But why is it taking 80 milliseconds? And you look at the flame graph, and there's not really anything obvious. And you look at the low-level counters, and there's not really anything obvious. Maybe we can have tools to shed light on efficiency. There was one project I did a while ago that shed light on efficiency, and that was a bake-off of different storage algorithms or protocols, so SIFs, iSCSI, FTP, NFS, V3, and V4. I've just typed in the numbers from memory there. And I was looking at cycles per operation. And so I was able to micro-benchmark them all using the same types of traffic. And it revealed that some protocols, the software implementation was way less efficient than others. And this also matched our expectations based on the maturity of the code bases. So like, yeah, NFS v3 is actually super efficient. And SIFs, you're spending like five times more CPU to do the same thing. And so relatively, once you've got that comparison, you've got some really hard data on efficiency that you can take to your manager and say, we should spend time. Because yes, we can go five times faster because this other version of the same thing goes five times faster. Well, that's great when you have something for this relative comparison. But most of the time, we don't. We just don't know. <laughs> so you'll hit SIFs, and that's all you got. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's 2,241 kilocycles per read. Is that good or is it bad? I have no idea. Matt Wilcox is giving a talk on memory management and about finding performance win, which goes from, Kate, is it which trees? You're doing the, here we go. We've got the 
speaker box? I've got, I've got a point. Yes. Yes, go. um, what's really interesting is like you have data like that, and I'm investigating problems, and you go, oh, that's really cool. This is the most efficient algorithm. But then you find, oh, actually, there's a scaling problem. If I, you, you know, you do the analysis, but you keep on doubling the number of processes, and you find out that a certain, a certain protocol suddenly just flatlines or isn't as good. So it's really, it's really easy and tempting to say, oh, this is the best algorithm, but you need to scale it. Um, to get sensible data, and, and the problem is the scaling part, where you run it across multiple whatevers, takes a lot of time, and the analysis there is is really crucial. Though, and, you, and, and I've seen so many people make the same problem, going, "Oh, but I know this is the best best thing for this particular machine." And you go, "No, it's not true for your new machine because it's got three times as much processor, or it's got bigger cache, or whatever." So, assume nothing. You know, algorithms do change depending on how how much extra resources you've got. You're right, scalability is a big issue. Um, it's far more complicated than, than a single slide will express. Uh, the, the example I'm going to give later is an AVL tree versus a red-black tree. And they're both O log N for lookup, but one has a much smaller constant factor. And that's one of the things that big O notation kind of leads to misleading. I mean, if you look at it, uh, a hash table is O1 for lookup. Yeah, but it's not, though. It's, it's still slower than doing a radix tree lookup because it has such poor cache performance. So, yeah, big O notation is important, but it's, it's not the be-all and end-all. And sometimes you're better using allegedly worse algorithms. Thanks. And, and, and the thing that strikes me about, and I'm looking forward to your talk, the thing that strikes me is for so many years we think, oh, yeah, memory management is so efficient and all these smart people have optimized it. And then you, you find something else. Oh, look, if we go to red black trees, it's even faster. Like, how could we have found that beforehand? How could we have measured the absolute efficiency of that code base and said, no, there's, there's more to do? I think new tools, new methodologies, but this is really future stuff, to be able to empirically come up with an absolute efficiency number for a given piece of code. So at the end of day status, if you still didn't solve it by end of Friday, you should find another job, because performance engineering obviously sucks. Now, I think maybe there is no problem. If you went through all of this and couldn't solve it, you're done. Post weeks, case study and retrospective. Write it down. Do a retrospective so you can find out how can, could we have debugged it faster? How could we have done it in five days? If it's repetition, if you keep seeing the same thing, you add it to the recent issue checklist or you teach the AI how to do that. And share things on blogs as well so other people can follow. So the industry is good, and, is good at some and not good at others of so these steps. We've got a lot of work to do. eBPF is super helpful for a bunch of them. So is Perf and Ftrace. Because the kernel is that common denominator that can analyze so many workloads. What needs to change, a lot of it's obvious, so to summarize, Perf wins that took more than a week shouldn't be, sh should be considered room for improvement. And we should think about that exercise of how do we make it less than a week instead of celebrating after that six-month win. We do need more tracing tools. Super hard to write. And I'd love to get the, the authors of the code at least to share their thoughts in some file for someone else to write the tool. Crisis tools should be installed in enterprise distro distros. That's probably one of the easiest things to fix. And stack walking should work by default for everything. We still waste weeks of time fixing it. And I've summarized it on the slide. Frame pointers, there are major companies that enable frame pointers for everything. So you can, like, the kernel, the, the kernel already works because you're already using the, the main stack walker. Then you've got the libraries like glibc, and then applications, and then runtimes like Java, and it's doing its own stuff. Can we be smarter about it? So Fedora may be the first distro to offer it by default, but it's been this huge effort to convince people about it. And there's all this energy people spend into, oh, what if we look bad on a Pharonix micro benchmark? It's like, I, I'm not a big fan of, of, of uh, that type of micro benchmark. I like to debug them and find out what they're really measuring. But can't we be smarter? I, if I'm going to spend energy discussing frame pointers, I want to think about more clever things. And Stephen Rostet just walked in. So with frame pointers, the problem is people want to ditch them out of the, the compiled instruction text to save these instructions. So I'm not doing a push of RBP, right? 
What if instead, like what Stephen does on Colonel Boot, where it has the F entry calls all, all over every kernel function, but then does a pass and then scrubs them all with nops, but remembers where they were, and then you F trace it and will turn them back on again. Why don't we just do that with frame pointers? We can, when you load a library, you, you always compile the library with frame pointers, but then when you load it, you scrub out the, the RBP calls with nops, and you write them back later, and now Stephen's interested. Yes? Um, are you familiar with S frames? With which? S frames. S F R A M E S. Simple frames. No, uh, it's, it rings a bell, but I don't it's, think it's a new feature. It's basically, do you know the orc unwinder inside the kernel? It's basically putting that into user space. And one of the things that we're working on doing is having the kernel be able to um, get access to these tables. And you, see, you could turn off frame pointers completely in user space, just like we do in the kernel and use orc unwinder for the kernel, and we could do, use the orc unwinder in user space if you want to do a full stack trace from the kernel or whatnot. Excellent, s -trace. This is the This is the conversation I want to have. I don't want to have the conversation of, oh no, but the micro benchmarks. I want to have the conversation on what smarter things can we do to meet these requirements. S-frames, so yes. is S-frames suitable from like a, a dynamic instrumentation Wait, context? Be, are you, are you going to be at Plumbers? Come with plumbers uh, if you can, because that's one of the talks that we're going to talk about is using S-frames for dynamic libraries, for JIT, uh, just-in-time compiling things. And we still need to get it in the kernel. Cool. I mean, there's, there's so many things we can do. We can fix this. S-frames, uh, not rewrite them out. Just we need the fix. It's so important for, and I think that's also part of it is people, a lot of people who have pushed back on it, what they're doing is a call for an action. Oh, we don't want to change it. We just leave frame pointers turned off because we're worried about potential downsides. Whereas I'm pushing for call to action. And that's what Faster Friday might help with is this is why we want to be able to solve everything in a week because it rewards investment in engineering. It helps people get faster. And I mentioned here EBKF custom runtime stack walkers. That's another way to do stack walking. Multiple people are working on it. That custom stack walker should ship with the the target. So if it's a Java stack walker, it should ship with, the, with OpenJDK so that it can be maintained with the C2 compiler and, and the Graal VM and whatever so that it can walk that, that stack. I actually put in the slides, here's the origin of it all. From 2004, it was a change to GCC because of I386, because GDB didn't need them, and they were competing with Intel, GCC versus ICC, but no, like no one runs ICC. So the circumstance that led us to turning off frame pointers don't, doesn't exist today in 2023. In summary, fast by Friday, any computer performance issue on Monday should be solved by Friday or sooner. That's a methodology. We have a lot of work to make sure preparation is done and new tooling to exonerate components quickly. I didn't talk about fixed by Friday. That could be the whole different talk. And, and an essence of it would be one of my favorite things is performance mantras. It's not by me, but I'm still looking for an exact reference, which is this is about changing code, about don't do it, which is eliminating unnecessary work. Do it, but don't do it again. Cache it, do it less, do it later. So great advice for developers actually fixing the given issue. My final takeaways, fast by Friday. Kernel superpowers, especially eBPF, are essential because we want to rapidly create tools and and rapidly analyze things in five days. And this is also a, an effort that's going to keep us busy for many years. So, because there's going to be OS changes, kernel changes, new tools, new methodologies. It will take many years to get to the point, but it's going to be great because then we will, the, the industry will move forward much more quickly again instead of all of these environments just stalling because no one has time to properly get to the bottom of things. That's my talk. So I've got time for maybe a, couple, a minute of Q&A. Any other questions? So in terms of um, writing tools and improving you know, our ability to introspect, do you, think that it's, do you think that eBPF should be the tool that people use to write those tools? Like, is like the BCC <coughs> approach kind of like the natural direction that we should be going in, or should people be, you know, adding whatever, proc FS or syscuddles or something like that. So the interesting thing about Fast by Friday, and 
thanks Jesper, who's I think in the, in the other room, who encouraged me to, to talk about the why, is that I've given a lot of talks which is like, eBPF is the solution. Now let's look at reasons to use eBPF. But with here, I'm talking about this is what, it, it's a different approach. We want to solve things in five days. And like, you could just use ftrace if possible. You could write some proc walker or some hacked up horrible thing that's ugly, ugly tools, if it serves the customer's need. So in my primary advice is whatever it takes. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't have to be BCC. It can be anything. So long as it, it the getting it solved in a week is more important than what, how you solve it. My advice for BC, BPF, in a nutshell, is BPF trace, because it's like orc. You can just write things in a hurry. BPF trace should be a default install on all enterprise distros. Then when you're using a tool a lot, you migrate it to BCC because you can do more options and whatnot. And if it's a super essential tool, you're using it all the time, stop doing it in eBPF. That should be something built into the kernel. And so it becomes a kernel facility. It might become metrics in slash proc. I talked about this at LSFMM once, my cache stat tool. Like, I don't want to be maintaining cache stat as a B BPF tool. It, I should get Matt to add it to MM. So it should be there as counts. So it's like a progression. You start with BPF trace, you're hacking away, and then BCC for a more uh, robust tool with options. But if it's super critical, let's get rid of eBPF. And it just becomes kernel counters or a kernel facility. I have a follow-up question. Um, yes. How do you think the kernel superpowers would look like today if uh, BPF was not, not added to the kernel nine years ago? So Alexi says, what about kernel superpowers if BPF was not added? I come from a, a world before this stuff. So I, when I started performance in 2003, it was all about reading the tea leaves and looking at these kernel metrics and, and, and drawing connections. I would do a lot with, it would just be a lot of work and a lot of this, this wizardry of inf inference of measuring these counters and these counters. F-trace does take us a lot of the way because we can get histograms and do custom latency measurements. Uh, but, but fast by Friday itself, I, I think that would be a challenge because the number of times at Netflix where we've needed a thing, I've been able to knock it out by the end of the meeting. Like here's, here's the tool at the end of the meeting. So I think the answer is if we didn't have the programmatic, programmatic ability to change the kernel on the fly, this would not be fast by Friday. It would be fast by the 30th of the, of the month or something. It would just take longer. It would take a lot longer. Other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>